If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question on your own before listening on. For part A, in order to find the coordinates of the points of intersection of the two equations, we can go ahead and set the two expressions equal to one another. Now since this is a quadratic equation, we'll have to subtract the 2x over to the left hand side so we can get the equation equal to 0. We can then factor out an x on the left side, leaving us with x times x minus 2. And then we can set each factor equal to 0. And then we can solve each equation for x. So we'll add the 2 over to the right hand side. We get the x coordinates of the two points of intersection. To find the y coordinates, we can plug each x back into either equation. Why don't we plug it into the y equals x squared? So when x is equal to 0, we can see that y would be equal to 0 squared or 0. And then when x is equal to 2, we can see that y is equal to 2 squared or 4. So the final points of intersection become 0, 0 as well as 2, 4. So this would be the correct answer to part A of the question. For part B, what we want to do is plot these two points as well as the equations that contain those points. So the first equation is a straight line, y equals 2x. Again, it connects the points from 0, 0 to 2, 4. The second equation is a parabola, y equals x squared, so we know that it too will pass through those two points, and it sort of curves its way underneath the straight line like so. It continues on upward that way and also this way. But what we're interested in is the region that is between the two curves, which we have colored in in light blue here. And then what we're going to do is take this region and we're going to rotate it about the x-axis in order to generate a solid. And what's important to note is that when we spin or rotate that region around the x-axis, it's going to form a sort of cavity or a sort of hole in the middle of it. And to get a sense of that, maybe we could draw a reflection of this region over the x-axis. So there is the region reflected over the x-axis. Again, hopefully one can visualize this, that as we spin this around, we're going to form a three-dimensional object where there's this sort of central depression or central cavity in that three-dimensional solid. And the reason it's important to understand that is because whenever we have a solid with a central cavity in it, we have to use the volume by washers method to determine its volume. And that method tells us that the volume is going to equal pi multiplied by an integral. And inside the integral, we're going to have a large radius squared minus a smaller radius squared. And then since we're rotating about the x-axis, we'll be integrating with respect to x. Now for the larger radius, what we do is we draw a line from our axis of rotation up to the curve that's basically furthest away from our axis of rotation. And we can see that that curve is the expression or the equation y equals 2x. So that means for the large radius, we're going to be substituting in 2x. Don't forget to square it, of course, because it's radius squared. For the smaller radius, we draw a line from our axis of rotation up to the nearer curve which is the parabola y equals x squared. We can label that equation here. And so for the small radius, we're going to have x squared. Again, don't forget to square it, and then dx. For the limits of integration, we're going to use the x coordinates of those points of intersection, so from 0 to 2. Now this integral can be simplified by squaring each of the radii. So we're going to end up with 4x squared minus x to the fourth, still integrating with respect to x. And then we can go ahead and actually do the integrating. And this is a relatively simple integral because all we have to do is add 1 to each exponent. So that's going to become 4x to the third and then divide by that new exponent. So that would be 3. Again, we're going to add 1 to the exponent to make x to the fifth and then divide by that new exponent, which is 5. And then we're going to evaluate this integral from 0 to 2. Now, when evaluating, we're going to plug in the upper limit first. So we're going to have pi and then we'll have 4 multiplied by 2 cubed over 3 minus 2 to the fifth over 5. But then we also have to plug in the lower limit and subtract these two quantities. Now the lower limit, when you plug it in, is actually going to be 0 because you're going to end up cubing the 0, multiplying by 4 thirds, that's still 0, and then you're going to subtract by 0. So basically when you plug in that lower limit, you're going to end up with 0. So it's essentially inconsequential. We can then just use some arithmetic to clean this up. And when we do that, we get 64 times pi all over 15. And so this becomes the correct answer.
Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, click the thumbs up icon and subscribe so you can stay tuned for other videos. You can send in your own question to the email address on the screen and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.